Sunshine program and it's capital S O N S H I N E. It's designed by uh, Reverend Darrell E. Calmet of the Macedonia Baptist Church in East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He was involved with the chemical people under Mrs. Reagan and he went around setting up uh, snowballs and snowflakes. But he saw uh, that there was more of a need uh, than that could supply. He saw that people needed to hear that God loved them and that uh, Jesus really tried to uh, provide good information to young people and to help them to understand uh, the issues that, that, that are pressing them every day. Uh, issues like drug and alcohol abuse, uh, some kids who may be coming from uh, homes where child abuse is another problem, how to deal with uh, their self-esteem, and all those necessary issues and, and try to answer those questions that young people are concerned about. So that they can leave here feeling a lot better than about themselves and feel that they have uh, a real good chance at uh, being the best that they can be. And all of this is done out of love and care and support and encouragement. Very good, very good. Thank you, sir. They're trying to get away. So, so I will go through the crowd. Would you tell us your name, sir? Jamal Smith. Jamal Smith? Yeah. Okay, and why are you here? Um, to learn and meet other people. Okay. Where, where do you live? Carbondale. Do you think uh, that this will be a good program? Yeah. And you like uh, meeting new people? Yeah. Okay. Very good. We might have to talk to you later. Is that your little brother that ran away from me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think his name is Peter. We're going to have to catch up with him, too, and talk to him. Come on back up at the <laughs> oh. yeah. What do you think about the Sunshine Program? Great. Yeah. Nice experience. And, and uh, you've been through some of these before? Mm-hmm. And what have you learned? 
<laughs> how to open up to people you don't know and how you can share with other people experiences that you have been through so that they may get stronger okay. and become stronger. And serve and help other people. I want to thank uh, Joel Smith for giving us this opportunity to express ourselves and, and to let people know uh, what the Sunshine Program is about. And uh, through programs like Baha'i Focus and through people like Joel and uh, letting us take his time and to come into your living room, then uh, people who need an alternative or somebody to, to talk to will know that they can call uh, someone in the Sunshine Program, somebody with the Sunshine Workshop. Hello, Carbondale. Welcome to Baha'i Focus. Just take a look at some of these happy faces. These are recent participants in the Sunshine Program. This is an anti-drug program sponsored by the Southern Illinois Ministerial Alliance. We here at Baha'i Focus are proud to help assist these people. We're going to be running a series of programs on the Sunshine Program because it is such a worthwhile program. Tonight's presentation will feature Tess Ford of the car. Also, it's shooting right. Very good, yeah. Uh, that's not as common as uh, snorting. That's, that's the more common usage that we find, but, uh, but it does happen. Also, uh, another way is uh, smoking. And this is with use of freebasing, uh, which you use some chemicals uh, that you light and then smoke it and this increases the potency of cocaine quite a bit. There is a new uh, type of cocaine that is being used on both coasts and uh, that's called crack and that's also smoked. It's in chunks and it's, it's still, I have some pictures that I'll pass around later to let you see some of the different uh, types of, uh, of uses of cocaine. Hello, Carbondale. Welcome to Baha'i Focus. There is a new drug education program in Carbondale sponsored by the Southern Illinois Ministerial Alliance. It's called the Sunshine Program. This is a very worthwhile program. We here at Baha'i Focus are happy to help publicize this program and we'd like to encourage others to participate. Today's Baha'i Focus shows the organizer and the founder, the Reverend Daryl Calamis, and one of the local ministers and the president of the Carbondale Ministerial Alliance, Reverend Daniels. Uh, as the platform for them to see uh, similarities uh, and how they feel about themselves. But uh, I think the overall uh, emphasis of that is to get people to understand what problems they have uh, and do something about them because you can't do anything about uh, a problem or uh, any idiosyncrasy unless you realize you've got one. And then you can, you know, then you can start work on it. It is in existence because we want to tell you about the Baha'i faith. Some of the basic things that uh, Baha'is believe is that there is only one God, that this God has sent a succession of prophets to reveal religion to mankind, that religion is successive, it is progressive, that the religions of the world are organically linked, that uh, it's all part of one big plan, and that in this age, God once again has sent a new prophet, and his name is Baha'u'llah. He's the founder of the Baha'i Faith. Baha'u'llah's teachings, he teaches that there is only one God, that uh, there really is only one religion. But the primary teaching of, of Baha'u'llah is that, uh, is that the idea that mankind is one, that it is the will of God and it's the will of the purpose of religion to teach mankind to live together, no matter where in the world you live, whatever culture, language, background, men or women, what race you are, it, 
it doesn't matter. That uh, there should be one great family. Well, that is the, the basic concept of what the Baha'i Faith is. We have a special guest with us today. Her name is Fern Chapel. She's been a friend of mine for a long time. And uh, she's kind of a special lady, and she's kind of a special family. I'd like to thank you for coming to Baha'i Focus. Thank you, Joel, for having me here. <laughs> How long have you been a Baha'i? Tell us about that. Oh, I've been a Baha'i since about 1969 when I came here to go to school. My oldest brother, and uh, some of the people in Carbondale might know him, Dempsey Clem, was all, already a Baha'i. And so I had exposure to the Baha'i faith through him. But at that time, we thought it was, you know, just some hippie movement, you know, love one another, give, you know, the uh, flowers, just, you know, some phase that my brother was going through while he was at college mm -hmm. at the time. And so I, I stayed with him a while, and I met the people that were Baha'is at that time, and they seemed okay, you know. But after that, he told me about something about the Baha'i faith, that it was a world religion. It just wasn't some movement. It was a real thing. It was a, 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 a religion. And it was one that was promised to man through the Bible. And at that time, you know, uh-huh, brother's gone off the deep end. And so what I did, you know, I told him, well, you know, show me. Because I was from a uh, Baptist background. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, you know, if it could be shown to me through the Bible, then to me, of course, it was right. And so he gave me a book, Thief in the Night, that had prophecies. It was written uh, by... William Sears. Yeah, William Sears. And it had prophecies from the Bible. And so, at the time that William Sears wrote the book, he was not a Baha'i, but he had, uh, he wanted to know for himself. And also, so my brother also told me, he says, now investigate this faith. Now, if you can find something wrong with it or something untrue about it, you come. Tell me. Well, I knew I could, you know, <laughs> being a uh, Baptist, I knew that, you know, hey, and also in the uh, Bible it said, you'll, you know, something about the tree, you'll know the tree by the fruit it bears because a thorn bush, you know, I'm paraphrasing this here, right. you know, can't give you good figs. And so I was going to hunt for me a few thorns in these writings, you know, and save my brother from himself. Well, I did. I took the, the book and I took the Bible and I went through it. And it proved to me, you know, by just going through it and so many prophecies that were fulfilled by Baha'u'llah, I felt that it couldn't be false. And I remember also in the Bible, one of the, um, one of the uh, sins that could not be forgiven was blasphemy against the Spirit. And so, thereby, I became a Baha'i. And so, there was two of us then. And so, it started spreading to, through our family. My mother, she was Christian, you know, of the Baptist faith also. And she was going to save her children from this movement, this, you know, this hippie movement. And thereby, she became a Baha'i by investigating, by reading, showing us where we were going to, you know, where we would go wrong. She became a Baha'i. And it sort of went through our whole family like that. Uh, I have four brothers and a sister, and we're all Baha'is, you mm -hmm. know, because we investigated. We, you know, you have to have an open mind. But you have to think with your mind. You can't just follow somebody, you know, just because they said this is what you do. That's why God gave you a mind, is to use it. And so that's what we did, and we all became Baha'i. That's one of the remarkable things about the Baha'i faith, is that it doesn't really matter which 
direction you approach it from. If you want to attack it, fine. If you want to oppose it, fine. Uh, if you want to go into it with an open mind and to investigate rationally, that's okay too. A lot of people just fall in love with it uh, instantly and uh, go into it with open arms, loving it. It doesn't really matter how you go into it because no matter which way you come in, whatever you're looking for will be there. Uh, I, I know of many people that have come in trying to, to uh, I should say, find the thorn, thorns in, in the story. And, and uh, they come out uh, usually a few months later being very strong, shining Baha'is. Nineteen sixty-six. Uh, how long were you, you were in the Air Force? I was in the Air Force for some twenty-four years. Most of my work uh, was concerned with the space program in one form or another. I was director of information at Cape Kennedy. Oh, you were. I was um, in the early days in the space program at Aberdeen Proving Ground, White White uh, White Stone, White Sands rather, and uh, was involved with the early German, German scientists that came over to this country after the war. The space that is fascinating. Werner von Braun and others. That is how. That is incredible. Could could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, um, I was with the Ordnance Department, uh, which had control of Aberdeen Proving Ground, and uh, the as a young boy. Let me go back a little bit. As a young boy, I was very much interested in space, and we had uh, formed the American Interplanetary Society, which was a society of young people interested in space and the possibilities of traveling out into space. We were the kooks of those days. Uh, now this is back, we're going back into uh, 19, uh, 19, the 1920s, uh, the 1930s. And, uh, but in Germany there was also an amateur rocket society. And so when the war came along, Hitler nationalized the amateur rocket society and they became the uh, scientists that worked at Pinamunda and other places that developed the V2 and the, the V1. Uh, in the United States, uh, those of us who had some experience some of, some of us formed a company called Reaction Motors, which developed the bazooka and other rocket uh, the sure. devices. Uh, but also a lot of us became, um, were involved in working on uh, Operation Paperclip, which was bringing the German scientists to right. this country. I've heard of that. And then uh, and also working with the captured German uh, V2s that went to White Sands in New Mexico. And from that came the learning which developed our rocket programs of the future. Uh, to the present day. And I was um, closely associated with some of the early days of this program. That is fascinating. Yeah. That must have been really exciting to be part of that program. It was. It was exciting to see the failures and to see the successes. And there were a lot of failures before there were any successes. At what point in this, this time here did you become a Baha'i or did you first hear about the Baha'i faith? Well, I was in the military in the early days. In fact, I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground when I first heard of the Baha'i faith. I read an ad in, I think it was uh, Newsweek or Time magazine about the Baha'i Faith and uh, wrote to them and never received a reply because I had been transferred in the interval uh, to Alaska. And the first thing I saw, um, I was director of information for the Alaskan Command, which was a joint command. And I saw an ad in, uh, oh, in the classified listing for the Baha'i Faith. I just happened to open a telephone book and uh, to look up something. I said, my God, they have never sent me any information on it. And I called them and mm -hmm. went to some meetings and within about two months became a Baha'i. Mm -hmm. and it's exciting because to have nine men and to have different administrative bodies, local spiritual assemblies throughout the world, to have these people as our governing body and know that we elected them, that they are using their... Uh, knowledge and spirit to guide us millions of Baha'is throughout the world is an exciting thing and to know that you're part of it and that you're helping to bring this about is really exciting. Mm -hmm. One of the really unique things about the Baha'i administration is the way that the people are elected and that is there is no candidates, there are no nominations that the way the members of the Universal House of Justice are elected is there is there are delegates selected from each country in the world, each, mem each country where there is a National Spiritual Assembly. Mm -hmm. And these nine men are elected 
a secret ballot with no candidates, no nominations. So essentially what you are getting, I think, is probably the nine most spiritual qualified men in the entire world. Mm -hmm. These are people that did not even seek the position, right. and yet they are, are elected from uh, the entire world. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how they're elected. We have people from all backgrounds, from uh, we had mm -hmm. a teacher, there's uh, doctors, and Liar. Persians, Orientals, mm -hmm. Black, mm -hmm. White, um, the Baha'i Universal House of Justice is truly representative of the entire spectrum of the world. That's right. What was it like to work with these people? Could you tell us some of the things about the members <laughs> of the House of Justice? Well, it's, it, to me it was so exciting because I went there, I knew some of them of course, but I still went there with this feeling that perhaps they were going to be so spiritual <laughs> that I might not be able to, <laughs> to approach them. Uh -huh, you know? uh -huh. And of course that's not true because the first thing they did when I came there was take me into their chambers and shower such love and laughter and fun with me that I knew that this was going to be a marvelous thing. Yeah. And to be there with them, to be with people for, that have been in a place for many years and to deal with them every single day and to be able to say after eight and a half years that you have never seen any of them out of the way do anything that was ugly or thoughtless or unkind, to feel their continuing love and encouragement uh, is, is to me alone a miracle, mm -hmm. you see. And then to be with staff members, people who were giving voluntary service, this doesn't mean that we're not cared for, but we are not a paid, uh, a salaried, I should say, a group of people who volunteer to serve there. And to see the kind of sacrifice and service and joyous living because uh, there was, we played cards and we danced <laughs> and we played golf and we went swimming and we had uh, wonderful talks and we met people from all over the world. Uh, President of the United States now is, right. is uh, tried to intervene or, or do what he could to, mm -hmm. to stop the persecution. Um, and then also we hear, uh, we hear uh, the Baha'is going before congressional committees talking about this problem. And uh, last year I was at a youth conference in Ohio where we had uh, a Baha'i congressman from Iowa speak to the group. A Baha'i congressman? Uh, or, or, uh, a congressman who spoke to the Baha'i group. Oh, okay, okay. He wasn't Baha'i. That kind of surprised me to hear you say that because Baha'is are neutral politically yeah. and I've mm -hmm. never heard of a Baha'i politician. It was and something that, I guess relating that to the idea of the Iranian persecutions, one thing that they say is that the Baha'is are not a religion, that they are a political group, and uh, which, which is a claim that is totally false since the Baha'is are totally neutral politically. And, uh, that is a uh, that is a claim that they could never support. So you were I think you, your your mother was saying that you're from a Baptist background. Yeah, all the way. Yeah, we're Baptist now. Forever. Yes, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yes, uh -huh. I did, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you think there was there was any conflict there between the Baptists and the Baha'i beliefs? Well, not really, because you know they believe in the one God. The Baha'is believe in the one God. So. The, the essence of the religion is one and the same, and there can't be any conflict because you know the, the, the sun is shining, the same sun is shining on Baha'is and Willie Baptists. Mm -hmm. There can't, can't be any conflict. What were some of the things that appealed to you as you were beginning to investigate the Baha'i faith? The thing that appealed to me the most about the Baha'i faith was that they practice what they preach. I mean, I'm being black, you know, and being used to the, a lot of prejudice from, you know, from different people. I got to the Baha'i faith, there was no prejudice. For once, I've, in this society in America, I've been able to enter into a, a group, a religion, whatever you want to call it, that was was free of prejudice. Absolutely free. Uh -huh. You hear what I'm saying? You can't understand because you aren't black, you don't know the subtleties that you go through, you know. But in in, in the Baha'i faith, hey, it was it was just like... It's gone. It's gone. And it works. It, it's, it's, there's no need for it. Right. There's no need for it. That's one of the things that really impressed me when I became a Baha'i in Chicago. <coughs> Chicago. It's an extremely racist place. There are certain territories that if you walk across the street, somebody might kill you for, for 
was just walking across the street. And when I became a Baha'i, all of a sudden, it was just gone. It was just like yeah. a great weight lifted off of you. And uh, for a while there, I thought that all of a sudden racism had just totally van vanished from the earth. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it took me a while to realize that uh, it, that was only true among Baha'is and it was only true among this group. So that really is true. Which yeah, is, uh, you, you go anywhere in the world. If he's a Baha'i, you know you don't have to worry about You don't have to worry about that. I don't care where you go. Any part, if he's a Baha'i, I don't care where he's from, hey, you got a friend. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And so it has to be something to, to a religion that, you know, that, that brings about that type of change. Mm -hmm. We talk about another religion, but hey, here it is, man. Here's, here's reality. Right. The reality is truth. Carbondale Baha'i Community. It's shown here on Channel 7, Carbondale Cablevision. Our guest today is Avery Krim. Everybody fondly calls her Mama. Thank you for coming on Baha'i Focus. Thank you. Avery is a Baha'i. Yes. And how, long have you, how many years have you been a Baha'i? I've been a Baha'i about 10 years. 10 now. years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it about the Baha'i faith that, uh, that you wanted to, to investigate it? Well, what I reached, I became a Baha'i is that I sit down and I read uh, Thief in the Night. I started in the middle of the book. Uh -huh. It was on a Sunday morning, and it got so good to me. I got to understanding so much about the thing that I didn't know that I have to begin in the, the beginning of the book, The Thief in the Night. That's uh -huh. the one that I like the best. That's the book Thief in the Night by William Sears. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. And after I read The Thief in the Night, I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe in the Baha'i faith. Thief of the Night is a book about Christian prophecies. Right, right, right. And Baha'u'llah fulfills the Christian prophecies. That's right, that's right. <clears throat> what was your background before you were Baha'i? I was a Baptist. Mm -hmm. And I was baptized in the Baptist church. And before then, I was a Presbyterian. My husband was a Presbyterian. Uh -huh. And so when I moved to Joplin, Focus. It is the principle of the Baha'i faith that members of different religions consort together and talk together and meet together in a spirit of friendship and harmony. And today we're talking with Rabbi Leonard Zoll. We're very happy to have him with us today. And I'd like to thank you for being a Baha'i Focus. Yes, pleasure. Um, we were talking, we wanted to do a segment on Israel. Um, you've been to Israel a couple of times, and I was just wondering. What do you think is the significance of the present state of Israel? Is, is there, as it relates to the Jewish religion, is there any significance to, to that? Yes, uh, the significance of the state of Israel is that it's the modern uh, reincarnation of ancient Israel. It's a place of uh, safety for Jews and Arabs and Christians who live there or anybody else who goes there. It's an experiment in applying the principles of the Torah to society. And um, the significance is that the land which is the state of Israel, or part of the, um, how shall I put it, the state of Israel is part of the land of ancient Palestine. It's not all of ancient Palestine, which became uh, Jewish at, uh, in those days. But the land that is the state of Israel is part of the Holy Land, called the Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land, and Jews believe that the land, the, the ground of itself has become sanctified. It's really interesting because uh, um, I sometimes belong to some organization where it's not really religious religion, uh, uh, religious uh, organization, and where there are people from other races, they find it very difficult to mix freely. Mm -hmm. But in the Baha'i faith, this is not there. Here am I in Kabul day meeting uh, some Baha'is for the first time, but I feel at home because sure. there are Baha'is. Sure. Name is Larry. Jamal Smith. Jamal Smith? Yeah. Okay, and why are you here? Um, to learn and meet other people. Okay. Where, where do you live? Carbondale. Do you think uh, that this will be a good program? Yeah. And you like uh, meeting new people? Yeah. Okay. Very good. We might have to talk to you later. Is that your little brother that ran away from me? Yeah. <laughs> I think his name is Peter. We're going to have to catch up with him, too. 
and talk to him. Come on back up at this. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about the Sunshine Program? Great. Yeah. Nice experience. And, and uh, you've been through some of these before? Mm-hmm. And what have you learned? <laughs> how to open up to people you don't know and how you can share with other people experiences that you have been through so that they may get stronger okay. and become stronger. And serve and help other people. I want to thank uh, Joel Smith for giving us this opportunity to express ourselves and, and to let people know uh, what the Sunshine Program is about. And uh, through programs like... <laughs> good information to young people and to help them to understand uh, the issues that, that, that are pressing them every day. Uh, issues like drug and alcohol abuse, uh, some kids who may be coming from uh, homes where child abuse is another problem, how to deal with uh, their self-esteem, and all those necessary issues and, and try to answer those questions that young people are concerned about so that they can leave here feeling a lot better than about themselves and feel that they have uh, a real good chance at uh, being the best that they can be. And all of this is done out of love and care and support and encouragement. Very good, very good. Thank you, sir. They're trying to get away. So, so I will go through the crowd. Would, would you tell us your name? Name the whole world for my The tree Sunshine program. 
and it's capital S-O-N-S-H-I-N-E. It's designed by uh, Reverend Darrell E. Calmet of the Macedonia Baptist Church in East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He was involved with the chemical people under Mrs. Reagan 